people, connectivity right. for that. Yeah. Good. Hello, I'm David Kirkpatrick of Techonomy, and we're here at Davos uh, in the snow with uh, Niall Dunn, who is the head of sustainability for British, no, not British, no, BT. That's right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, somebody I've known for a number of years and who's really one of the biggest thinkers about business's role in the modern economy as it's evolving to what uh, Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum calls the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So welcome, Niall. Thank you for being here. And tell me, what, is it, what does it mean to be in charge of sustainability for BT? What do you think about? Well, I mean, the first thing is to look at the purpose of the company, to use the power of communications to make a better world. And we're the world's oldest telecommunications company, so 170 years wow. old this year. But that telecommunications <coughs> company, given the importance of content to the industry now, and you've seen in the US, AT&T and Time Warner doing things to make content much more integral to the, to the value that networks can create, um, we've been becoming a, a TV channel with a specific focus on, on sport, which we launched after the, the London Olympic Games. So really, um, my role is about how we bring that purpose to life through the biggest um, strategic decisions that the business makes, whether that's a TV channel being purposeful or whether that's a network strategy being purposeful or indeed making sure the culture of the company and the products and services that we innovate uh, reflect that purpose. Okay, well, the digital environment is changing a lot right now. We have the sudden rise of these massively powerful global internet companies. Uh, we have a lot of concerns about that. We have a lot of concern about things like fake news and interference with the networks in all kinds of ways. How does that enter into your considerations? What are you worried about well, and, th th and excited about? I, I think we're just beginning to figure out what this all means. Um, and actually, this is why things like Davos are so good, because I think everybody's got a bit of the puzzle. You know, the cyber guys have part of it, counterintelligence have part of it, um, you know, apps have part of it, the, the, the network companies have part of it. And when you come together, you can start to see a picture emerging. And when I, you know, put that picture together in my head, what, what I'm seeing is an exacerbation of the divide that W.B. Yeats, who was a, a famous Irish poet, wrote about the split between the left and the right just after the First World War. He talked about the center can't hold. Things split to the left and they split to the right. And I think in the age of networks, what's happening on the liberal left is we're having um, bubbles emerge where we're now more sure than ever that the left is right, that you know, we meet people who think like us and talk like us and we can find research that substantiates our worldview and that makes us a more evangelical than ever before that we're right. All of us, you're All, saying. Well, the, the left. Well, actually, a lot of us fall into one of these buckets or right. another, but and, go on. And, yeah. and I'd, I'd wager it's mostly the left, you know, in Davos. But okay. on the right, you have a similar bubble that's emerging. Now, the issues with this are not just the obvious one, which is the humanity has always thrived when we've actually found that middle ground. The great leaders of the past have reached across the aisle, they've brought people together. And technology needs to be no different. Technology, for it to fully realize its social and economic value, it has to be truly democratized. So these bubbles have to be burst by a much more people-centric network that actually looks at the most disconnected, most vulnerable people in society and works back from their issues, uh, innovating around the, 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 you know, the, the, the solution solutions that, that will exist and emerge quicker than ever thanks to a, di a digital world. Wow, well that's a, it's an encouraging idea that you think it could even happen. How could we burst those bubbles and create maybe more of a, a genuinely inclusive dialogue about society's future, which is really what it's all about, right? Well, there's a, I mean, there's a couple of things. Um, I think the first thing is to adopt a furthest first mindset. So um, within the four billion people globally who are unconnected, the next billion um, will happen over the next kind of five to ten years. But then there's a big lag reaching the next, uh, the next two, three, four billion after that. Um, current rate of projections according to the Alliance for Affordable Internet is that we will reach full inclusion sometime in, sometime in 2042. 2042. 2042. That's a long time to wait. It's an incredible risk. Too long. It's an incredible risk to the delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals. It's a, an incredible yes. risk to... I have my Sustainable Development yes, Goals um, pin on. Yes. Um, and and uh, so we need to think differently. And um, that's why furthest first, you know, working back from that last billion. And um, the second thing is um, using public-private partnerships. I think philanthropy 
has really grown up and now has a role at the table when we're thinking about big capital allocation globally. Philanthropy is no longer about checks for charities. It's actually about de-risking the system. Philanthropy might take uh, some of the risk out of the system, where a market won't naturally um, evolve. Um, a philanthropic initiative can sometimes be that initial skunk works activity that allows us to, to activate for the world's most um, the poorest people. Um, but then, uh, as affluence starts to emerge and as they're able to afford connectivity and they're able to avail of content, um, then to allow markets to emerge and for more shared value solutions to start kind of coming into play. But at the moment, um, I would say, and I think a lot of my friends who, who work in civic society and, and work in government would say, we're, we're all in our silos. Mm. And we're not using this kind of rallying call of let's work from the last billion, let's create public-private partnerships that brings philanthropy into the table. To get uses, there sooner than 2042. Uses the government money, uses private sector investment and creates structures, kind of like what we have in the UK with the BDUK scheme, where government put up money, we put up money, and then there was an auction process whereby anybody could come in and bid for a public-private partnership to get fibre to, to you know, the, the majority of the UK. That's uh, working now? That's working now. 84% okay. you know, of people have access you know, as, to, to broadband as, as we sit here today. You know, okay. And we lead amongst the G20 countries. So, um, yes, I think, I think it's working. But so, so the idea is, do you have a date you'd prefer to use in 2042, which is sort of at current pace? I mean, do you think we could get there by 2025? Um, and if so, how would we do that? Or however so how are we going to get there sooner, concretely? So I asked Paul Kagame that exact question uh, just in a session that I came the from President earlier Rwanda, on. on, right. on you know, and Paul Kagame, President Kagame, has led on getting fiber. He's uh, 4,000 kilometers of optical fiber rolled out uh, over the last couple of years to, to, to his people. Um, and I asked him that, that exact question. And he said the key was that every government department in the world needs to look at a digital first strategy when it's actually allocating its resources. So all countries within the flags of the United Nations actually looking to see not how do we create a digital department, but if you're in education, what's your digital strategy? If you're in health, right. what's your digital strategy? And I think that allows us to do much more joined up infrastructure planning. When you're thinking about your roads, your railways and your bridges, what's your ICT strategy? Maybe you don't need um, all of that uh, traffic um, um, congestion alleviation in Mexico City if you're actually creating more decentralized systems where people are actually able to live um, and thrive in more remote areas. You can actually solve that by creating much more joined up infrastructure strategies. Um, and I think Paul Kagame, President Kagame, was right when he said that the key is actually governments thinking about digital first and each department having its own digital strategy. Strategy. But I think another big part of the equation is what we've learned in the UK is that private sector money, private sector telecommunications company then being able to match fund in a lot of instances um, will further um, um, scale delivery. Um, you know, and when you do mobilise, I mean the lessons from the UK would, would say it can be a kind of a five year period to get um, you know, tens of millions of people connected to broadband. You know, so when the whole machine starts to pull in the same direction, uh, you know, success can happen very quickly. So is BT doing that kind of partnering in pl various places around the world? How is that going right now? Yeah, so we're, we're um, uh, I mean, learning an awful lot about, you know, the different social issues mostly. And um, we do um, satellite connectivity. Uh, the network is in 170 countries all around the world. That's connectivity for the world's biggest businesses. Um, big business in cloud and data analytics, as you can imagine. Um, but increasingly what we're saying, seeing is that if we keep looking at all of these markets with our customers um, from a technology-only mindset, we're actually missing huge segments of society. Um, so, for example, if you solve accessibility and you solve affordability, um, girls primarily miss out on the technology. Boys get access to it much quicker. Mm. So uh, we've been working in countries like India to look at 120 million teenage girls um, whose social networks are small, you know, effectively mom um, and uh, nobody else, um, and asked ourselves the question, what could we actually do um, to improve their social networks? And, uh, you know, this would be quite an interesting 
um, maybe separate discussion, sport has emerged as an incredibly powerful intervention even before a technological intervention because you get the girl out of the house. What a great idea you to give use her a, sport. You I give love her, that. You give her a community. Mm. You give her access to friends. You give her self-confidence and self-esteem. Mm. You involve boys in that equation too, so you're not creating a divide. You incentivize them to be part of the solution as well. At that point, giving her access to information and allowing her to just learn whatever it is she wants to learn, to innovate, to, to um, uh, you know, kind of create social networks of her own, the multiplier effect associated with that is way more powerful than those interventions, a technology-only intervention or a sport-only intervention. So we have to be thinking and working with civic society to figure out how we change social norms. And I'm incredibly excited about the potential of this type of cross-cutting approach to work in Latin America, to work in India, and to work in Africa as well. And for us, maybe as a technology company, to put our technology assets into play in partnership with others, but also becoming a sports channel with BT Sports to think about how the Manchester Uniteds and the, you know, the, the cricket clubs of the world can also um, you know, uh, storytell and inspire people to you know, form teams and communities far the most vulnerable. Okay, is that a coincidence that you've gotten into the sports business and you think sport is a way of helping bringing w women into the system in India? Or is that something that you kind of clicked in your head, you realized you had the tools and you applied it here? I mean, that's, a, I mean, I think sport it sounds like it's a great business in the UK, for example, no question. But to the idea of leveraging that for inclusion strikes me as very savvy and kind of sly like a fox in a way that we need. That's the kind of thinking we need. But so, tell so, me a little more of the evolution of that. So um, the evolution is really quite simple. In uh, 2008, 2009, where not a lot of companies in the world were making big capital investments and taking on a lot of risk. We put two, three billion pounds of our own money aside to roll out fiber uh, infrastructure within the UK. And the UK government matched that, and the BDUK scheme was, was, uh, was created. The time frame for that business case was a, you know, a multi-decade business case in terms of return to us. And we're one of the largest marketers in the UK. We have a lot of you know, communications muscle that we can put into play to, to talk to people about digital inclusion. But back then, we were talking about you know, 80 meg connectivity and you know, what this can do to actually change your life. People weren't really getting it. But the London 2012 Olympic Games taught us hmm. that sport as a kind of a way to actually um, drive a digital inclusion agenda was incredibly powerful. Wow. It, it unified hmm. the nation. It brought people together like, like nothing else. Even more importantly, we learned that sport belongs in the community. So when we launched BT Sport, which is part of our London uh, legacy commitment to, to the games, and the TV studio is in, is in East London, you know, where the Olympic TV studios were, mm. um, we gave it away for free. We gave it away for free to our customers because we believed in the concept of democratizing sport. We thought it would disrupt the market, and we also thought it would drive broadband sales, and indeed it did. You know, the commercial success of the company since that particular strategic intervention, uh, you know, the share price and other things have been going in the right direction. Oh, classic, doing well by doing Doing good. I yeah. want to. We've got to wrap soon, but I wanted to go back to what you were saying about Kagami because I know quite a bit about Rwanda. And what's so interesting about that country is, number one, it has made an unusually large commitment to digital eco ecosystem in inclusion. Although still more than half the country is disconnected, mm -hmm. it's way ahead of its neighbors. And at the same time, its economic growth is accelerating much faster than its other neighboring countries in Africa. So it's proving out in Rwanda. And yet, Kagami is a uniquely enlightened figure when it comes to digital stuff. He's a controversial figure in some ways, but certainly understands the role of the digital world to drive economic growth. I don't think most government leaders do yet, and I've actually heard even still, although this has been on the agenda here year after year after year in Davos, I haven't really heard enough leaders here say that they understand that. And in fact, I just heard a top global leader bemoaning how little government leaders across the planet really still get how critical these digital issues are. Is that what you experience and how worried are you about that and what can we do about it? It's an interesting conundrum, David, because ultimately 
world leaders are supposed to come to places like Davos and uh, give off an air that they have all the answers. But the really interesting thing about this new digital world that's emerging is that we actually don't have all the answers. Yeah. But what we can do is create the enabling but systems. But they're not even asking the right questions but is what I'm saying. Create, like, so there's a narrative, a pervasive narrative around the death of blue collar, maybe even the death of white collar because of AI and because of drones and because of you know, right. our ability to automate everything at the moment. Okay. We have a program in, in Ireland, you know, where, where I'm from, um, called BT Young Scientist, and it's, a, it's, it's almost like a social movement. Every kid in the country is part of this major event, J January every year. You should actually come next year. Mm. Every kid um, comes and looks at the, the local and, and world issues and thinks with a technology-first mindset around wow. how they solve those issues. Fantastic. The kids that have won that have gone on invariably to win the European equivalent, the European scientist, uh, eight years out of the last ten. Um, but also they've gone on to start big businesses in Silicon Valley in, in California. None of those kids... Were the Collison brothers part of that? <laughs> <laughs> none of those kids... That's none, right. of, none of those kids are actually sitting there lamenting the loss of blue-collar jobs, the fact that they can't work in that factory in Cork or that factory in Detroit. They're all creating the future. And I'll tell you what, when you see the projects that they're coming up with, the, the future is incredibly inspiring. So that gives me encouragement. Now, more global leaders actually need to be looking at these kids and looking at what's coming out of right. their, you know, their projects and, and trying to see what digital can actually do to change the way we work and live. That's a really interesting point. Uh, I would add to that just one thing that you stimulated in me. Uh, I would say one of the top issues here in Davos this year is this question of what is happening with automation and jobs. And yet it isn't really on the political agenda at least not in the United States. It could be that concern about that very issue will force more government leaders globally to start thinking a little more about the true digital landscape we're living in, which is core to what techonomy is all about and yeah. clearly core to the work you're doing. So I hope that happens. It's so good to have you here joining us with the Techonomy live webcast from Davos, and I look forward to talking to you more. Niall Dunn from BT, the Chief Sustainability Officer. Thanks again, Niall. Thanks, David. Pleasure. Thank you. Great to have you. Cheers.